Hello, everybody, and welcome to the General Eclectic Podcast. I'm your host, Kale Zeldin, and with me, as typically, uh, is Rod Dreer. Uh, Rod is still in Budapest, but we have a special um, episode, at least for me, uh, today, because we have um, a friend of mine, uh, a, a, a YouTuber, I guess, a podcaster, and really a, um, a, a, a Protestant minister in the Christian Reformed Church, uh, Paul Vanderclay. Um, Paul, it is great to see you. You've had me on your show many, many moons ago. Um, it's just great to have you. How are you today? I'm doing very well. It's great to be here. Good. And so, uh, Paul, Paul, by the way, is a superior beard haver. You forgot yes, to yes. give him that yes. title. Yeah. We, well, you know, well, again, it's because I, I, I consume so much Paul content. I can sort of, I know where I am, you know, with, with the, when the podcast happened based upon, you know, the, 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 the beard, the, the beard, the beard moving out. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the, 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 the great beard game here. Um, but anyway, um, Paul um, does a lot of work on, you know, what, what is the phrase, Paul, the, this little corner of the internet. Yeah. And I first stumbled upon Paul, um, really, I think I saw a Jordan Peterson video and I was like, wow, this is actually pretty cool. I think I saw, I saw the video because I saw Rod had blogged about it. So I clicked on it and then right away I was like, oh, this guy's real. Like there's gotta be some, some serious Christian person who's talking seriously about Peterson. And so I, you know, put it in the YouTube search engine and you popped up and I've pretty much been watching your stuff ever since. So at any rate, Rod, um, I brought you two together today because you are working on a new project. You know, this is, you sort of um, live not by lies is, is, is out and, and, and doing its thing. And before that, of course, the Benedict option, but when you uh, announced, I think on your blog, uh, some some months ago that you were um, engaging on a new project uh, and and you're getting that going. I thought, man, I got to get Paul and Rod together and talk. So uh, without further ado, could you just sort of what's what's going on with this new project? Like, what are you doing? And and Paul, feel free to chime in whenever. Well, well, you know, uh, Kale, the the central uh, question or uh, issue that has, been, that has preoccupied me for the last twenty years, at least, and through my last two books is the collapse of Christianity in the West, Christian faith and belief. And uh, I've tried to diagnose why that's happening, to talk about how we can protect ourselves from it as Christians. And uh, now with this new book, I'm going to talk about how we might be able to turn that around. And this is not a book about culture war uh, at all. It's going to be a book about reenchantment because I believe that at the root of our problem is we have lost a sense of the sacred as being eminent in the world. And, um, you know, I, when I was interviewing people for uh, the Benedict Option book, I talked to Christian Smith, the uh, sociologist of religion at Notre Dame, the guy who in, invented the phrase moralistic therapeutic deism. And something he told me back then really stuck in my mind. He said that if we are going to turn around the situation for the church in the West, it ain't gonna happen through moralism. We're not gonna, and we're not gonna be able to argue people into uh, coming back to the faith or being moralistic about it. And there's nothing wrong with being moral, but mor morality and moralism are two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I decided, you know, thinking about what might work, uh, I thought about my own conversion uh, mm -hmm. back uh, in my, when I was a young adult. It's a story that's very familiar to readers of my blog. Uh, very briefly, I walked into the, Cathedral at Chartres when I was 17, had no idea what was about to happen to me, but I was overwhelmed by beauty and a sense of wonder and the awe of God and the fear of God, fear in the sense of respect of God and being in the presence of an immensity that I had not prepared for it. Growing up in you know, America in the late 20th century had not prepared me for it. And I walked out of there on a search. I wanted to know the God that had inspired men eight centuries earlier to build a temple like that in his honor. Uh, six or seven years later, I was sent by my newspaper. I was a brand new journalist to interview an elderly uh, Catholic Monsignor in his 90s who uh, had, before he became a priest in midlife, he had been an artist of some note and an, uh, in, he introduced Diego Rivera and Orozco to America, but he had a couple of miracles that happened to him and brought him back to the faith and made him into, uh, brought him to the priesthood. When I sat there interviewing this old man in his uh, assisted living room in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I, I was just, he was crying uh, over the things, the miracles that had happened to him 
as if they had happened a week, a week earlier. And I knew, I didn't have the words for it, but I knew I was in the presence of a witness of someone who had seen Christ in an extraordinary way. And he testified to that by the way he changed his life. I mean, he was an artist and an architect and became a Catholic priest. So uh, I ended up saying, I, I can't put this off anymore. I've got to become a Catholic. Well, later on, I read that Pope Benedict XVI talked about how the greatest um, uh, arguments the church has for itself is, are not the actual propositional arguments, but the art it produces and the saints. Well, what does he mean by that? I, I take him to mean that uh, we, we respond to, to the presence of God made incarnate in beauty and um, made incarnate in the lives of holy men and women. And these things point us to God. They open our minds up to propositional truth. And that's certainly what happened to me. So uh, I've, I've been thinking for a long time about doing a book about this sort of thing, but never quite got a handle on it. Well, fast forward to 2018. I was in Italy uh, on the Benedict Option book tour. My last night there, I was in Genoa in a church, gave a talk. When it was over, a man pushed forward to me, and it is an older man. He said he his English wasn't very good, but he said he had been praying in his studio that day and the Holy Spirit told him to come hear the American speak and to give the American this particular drawing that the man had made an engraving. He gave it to me and it was a saint, a medieval Italian saint. I didn't know who this was, Saint Galgano, he said. This is the temptation of Saint Galgano. That's the drawing. It was a, a medieval saint kneeling down with his um, with a sword and a stone and his eyes are raised to the heavens and he's looking at the Eucharist uh, at the Eucharist with a cross on it on top of a like uh, on top of a tree top of the mountain but there is a serpent coming out of his head winding down to the ground with a human face on it trying to get him to take his eyes off of Christ and look down to the ground beautiful drawing but I didn't know what it had to do with me that night I looked up Galgano in my hotel room and he was a medieval saint who had been away from the church. He was violent. His mother had prayed for him to return to Christ. He had a vision of St. Michael the Archangel who said, put your sword down and, and come serve God. He wouldn't do it. He had another vision on top of a, a hill and he said, look, to, he said to God, it would be easier for me to put my sword in this stone than to do as you ask. He brought his sword down and went into the rock. To this day, you can go there and see it. I did go see it. And uh, Italian scientists in the year 2000 tried to explain, I went there to debunk it, took x-rays of the rock and all that. They can't explain this. The sword is deeply embedded in the rock and the metal on the sword is 12th century as according to the legend. Anyway, I found this really remarkable, um, but I didn't know what it had to do with me. And uh, Paul, there is a point to this. I'm, I'm about to come to the end of it. So um, 2020, I'm really depressed. It's the spring of 2020. We're two or three months into COVID. I was struggling with my family. I, you know, people who've read my books for a while know that I have a really rocky relationship with my family in Louisiana, and it's it's been hard. Um, but I just was so stuck in the past in thinking about why can't things be better? Why am I so powerless in the face of all this? I forced myself to go to confession one night because I hadn't been to confession in a while. When it was over, I felt so light. Um, and um, everybody in my family, uh, and my, my wife and kids were asleep, but I decided to watch a movie. Well, in those days I was watching the movies of Andrei Tarkovsky, the great Soviet director. And um, there's one of his I hadn't watched before called As One Does. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> As One Does, old Soviet movies, of course, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, Tarkovsky is a really interesting guy. And, and he was some sort of uh, Orthodox Christian, <laughs> though I think he was kind of a hinky one. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, and this movie I saw is called Nostalgia, Nostalgia. He made it in Italian after he left the Soviet Union, 1983. The movie is about a Russian writer who is in Italy to work on a book, but he can't focus on his work because his mind is so stuck in the past and the family he left behind in Russia. And he's paralyzed. And there's so much beauty all around him, but he can't see it because he's so locked in his head. 
And as the movie starts and they're talking about this, I'm thinking, golly, that's that's me. I'm uh, I mean, I believe everything about I'm supposed to about Christianity, but I can't. I'm just so fixated on the family problems. So uh, toward the end of the movie, there's a dream sequence in which the Russian writer is walking through this ruined cathedral, or a ruined church, big church. And you can hear the voice of the Virgin Mary say, again, dream sequence, mm-hmm. speaking to God, saying, Lord, please speak to him. He's so lost. He, the writer, needs to hear from you. And the voice of God says, if I spoke to him, would he even be able to hear me? And the Virgin says, well, then show yourself to him. He's so lost. And God says, I show myself to him every day, but he won't see me. And I thought, that is so me. So uh, when the movie was over, I Googled to see where is that beautiful ruined church? It's the Abbey of St. Galgano. Hmm. The same one the artist came forward to me in 2018 and said, I don't know why I'm giving you this, but So I said, the Lord wants me to do something here. And uh, the more I started thinking about this drawing that that Luca Dom, the artist, gave me, the more I saw this is an icon of my project because the saint here was only able to see God when he sacrificed his own passions, the sword, that's a symbol of the sword and the rock, and gave his life to Christ. And he had his eye in the drawing on the Eucharist. It's like the sun that illuminates everything. This is a symbol of the eminent God, the, the, the ultimate symbol in material things of God's presence among us. But this thought inside his head is coming out and trying to get him. It has a human face. It's not a serpent. It's a serpent, but it has a human face trying to get him to take his eye off of heaven, off of the he- heavenly things and look down at earthly things. Well, in that that movie, the Tarkovsky movie, when the artist in the dream sequence is walking across the nave of the of ruined St. Galgano Church, he's looking down. He's not looking up at the glory of God all around him, but he's got his face down into the earth. So that's the background, Paul, uh, for the book. Now, uh, we can talk. I, I'd like to get your reaction to that, and then I can tell you about how I plan the, this book out and some of the things I'll be talking about. Uh, and trying to help people, my readers, wake up to the wonder in the world all around us and to get us to stop being like the artist in, in the movie and like the kind of man I was. Yeah. At, the, at the event you did in Sacramento, you ran through this and, and you showed us the, um, the gift that you received from that artist. Now, as, as a pastor, none of this surprises me at all. When you... I, I, when you talk to people, people have stories. Sometimes they're they seem fantastic if you if you are so oppressed by a particular flat um, nihilistic view of the world that is so pervasive. The you know what we've seen in American culture in terms of the loss of the. Uh, visible presence of Christianity, I think, happens partly because churches have lost the courage to be honest about their stories. Dallas Willard had a, there's a video on YouTube of Dallas Willard t- at, with, talking to the Veritas, at the Veritas Forum. That's one of the things. And, and he, was, he was talking about the fact that worldviews are in many ways um, socially managed via hierarchies. He, he tells the story of he's walking through a, a modern university campus with a young man. And basically, Dallas is watching this young man interact with other people on the on the college campus. And he loses status when he tells stories like the kinds of stories that you told. I th- actually think that world is coming to an end that modernity is receding and the challenge that we will face probably in the next hundred years will be a, once again, a a sifting through the enchanted stories rather than uh, this this enlightenment worldview that just sort of tried to put a lid on the whole thing and deny it all. I think think that lid is, is going away and so then the challenge is going to be, as in some ways, the, the same challenge that was met at the time of the Protestant Reformation, 
how can we how can we know the genuine article how can yeah. we know the true thing how can we know our path through this world of shifting images and competing enchantments so um i think your 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 book is timely that will be the question when i think about the conversations i have with a lot of people now in this little corner of the internet that is very much into enchantment the questions are well if we can reliably produce an enchanted experience with psychedelics isn't that the way forward and so I think those will be the challenges we face, which, which will again be significant challenges for the church, but the church always faces challenges. That's our, that's our path. Well, yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, I found interesting in doing research for the book is that um, we, we all know that, especially with the millennials and Gen Z, uh, Christianity is in collapse, but these people are not moving to atheism. They're moving into whatever, or as I think Robert Bella called it in an earlier generation, Sheilaism, that they just make it up as they go along. But this has um, this has spiritual uh, effects. I, a Catholic priest I know down in New Mexico or Arizona, I forget which, told me that he spends a lot of his time his uh, ministering to immigrant families uh, from Mexico and Central America who find their houses are demonized because they're practicing a syncretic form of Christianity. They're bringing in, you know, pagan stuff and mixing it in with, with their Catholic faith. He said, I always go to them and, and you know, after I bless their house and get rid of the evil spirits there, um, I tell them, don't mess with this stuff. You won't have, if you, if you leave it alone, you and keep keep your faith pure. You're not going to have these problems, and they never do. They always go back to the like the dog returning to his own vomit. They return to the syncretism, and I think this is the syncretism is not just something that you know immigrants from uh, Central American peasant cultures are going to have. I think this is something that is uh, uh, shot through middle class culture as well. I I also think. So part of my project, this is where I think Kale wants me to go. Part of my project has been to try to, to try to inform the imagination of what we mean by this word spirit. Kale had been following uh, hand-waving freak outery, uh, BJ Campbell. I saw a conversation with him on Rebel Wisdom, which is one of the channels in this little corner of the internet that we've been developing. And I immediately saw that we're finding a re-understanding of what I believe Paul was talking about in the New Testament as principalities and powers governing this world, that spirituality isn't of course modernity pushed that over into a private sector and say so if you have public you have your politics over here and you have your private world over here so you can have your santeria altar or you can do your psychedelics and you know whatever you do sort of keep that separate but the what i noticed in bj campbell's work was he was basically noting that there are spiritual forces that possess not just individuals, as you might find in the New Testament, but possess nations. And you, you much more have this vision, which is in keeping with, let's say, what we find in the book of Daniel, where there needs for, for minds to change and for nations to change, there needs to be a spiritual movement. And I talked about it in, in one conversation with... Um, with um, a, a Roman Catholic young man who has returned to the faith from atheism, and John Verveke, who is a post-theist, uh, former colleague of Jordan Peterson's at University of Toronto, and talked about the fact that we, we know we can see conscious agency down fairly well. We know that, for example, our pets have a degree of consciousness but we have a higher degree of consciousness. We have higher rationality. We can sort of play with our pets, manage our pets because of that. And that there are levels to this and that in modernity, we, we are accustomed to looking at levels down, but increasingly, 
you know, through BJ Campbell and some other people, people are beginning to awaken to the idea that what if there are levels up of consciousness? And what if there are levels up of agency that are in fact colonizing and moving and governing? And then suddenly, I think part of why modernity want to keep that idea away is because it's a terrible, it's a terror terrorizing thought that there are powers and principalities that have that have designs on our future and that to sort of look at C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters envision us as food. Yes. Yes. And and you know the to me I've I've never been I've you know having worked overseas, having grown up in inner city ministry, having a lot of experience through the broad range of Protestantism, kind of the, the flat modernity materialism, it had a degree of power, but I just knew too many people that were credible and honest that tell stories that just doesn't fit into modernity. One miracle sends the worldview of Sam Harris packing. Yes. And so it's extremely fragile. And so it does give way, but then people via, I think, this, this other spiritual force that is within our culture, imagine that they can somehow be individualist, heroic warriors that, that can sort of go out there and defeat dragons, when, of course, if they've even ever met a tiger in the jungle, they wouldn't imagine that a dragon is something that they could deal with on their own. Right. And, you know, when I was, you mentioned Sacramento, uh, listeners should know that you and I actually met when I gave a workshop last fall out in Sacramento on Live Not By Lies. And at that workshop, Paul, I don't know if I told you this, but um, the pastor who was our host, his wife told me that a few years ago, she used to be part of a team of uh, fellow evangelicals who would go out to Burning Man and uh, pray with people and share the gospel with them. But they didn't go didn't go out there uh, undercover, but they also didn't advertise, here we are Christians here to witness to you. They just set up a tent like all, like the psychic healers, the palm readers and all that. And she told me it was really strange what happened, that people would find their way to them because, and, and they, these, these uh, unreligious people who had no background in Christianity, young people going to Burning Man, would say to them, you have stronger magic than these others. And they really made a lot of like the, the palm readers around them one year got really angry at them mm -hmm. because the Christians were stealing business. And she told me that they had one, um, I, I've never been to Burning Man, but she said that one year they had a, a group that arrived in there at the tent where the Christians were praying for people. And uh, they said, oh yeah, we came in at the front part of the, the big area where all these tents were. And we said, where are those people who were praying? And they said, oh, follow the light over there. There was a light in the air above their tent. And these pagans saw it, right? Yeah. And uh, the, the lady told me, the pastor's wife said, we finally quit going back there because it just got too spiritually dark for us. But mm -hmm. she said, that was real. The things yeah. we saw there were real. And what was interesting was the people who came to them uh, seeking prayer and deliverance did not understand that they were Christians. These are just people who are in touch with a stronger magic. And I think that that is a sort of thing that I want to talk about in, in this book. And one of the things I'm gonna do for the book is get stories like this from Protestants, from Catholics, from Orthodox Christians, from people who have had miraculous encounters and encounters with the demonic, because they're, um, there's nothing that can send me back to the straight and narrow, like reading stories or talking to people who have had had encounters with the demonic. And I think this is I think this is coming. Clay Rutledge is a he's he's an atheist. He re, he's he's been writing about the deconstructed basically and. The point that he makes, he recently had a very interesting conversation with Jordan Peterson on nostalgia. He's done a fair amount of psychological work on nostalgia. And, it, and even though nostalgia sort of gets a bad rap, some of what he's done shows that it's actually an extremely powerful 
it's an extremely powerful element among us that gives us a sense of cohesion and narrative co uh, coherence for communities as they move forward. And I think his, all of his findings are simply true. And it's, it very much agrees with what I found in terms of hundreds of conversations with people who have sort of gone through the Jordan Peterson rabbit hole. I, I actually, Rod, and I was going to tell you this, I didn't get a chance. I looked for you after the conference, didn't get a chance to connect with you again. But I, part of the reason I started my YouTube channel was I watched what you were doing blogging. And I thought it was really cool how you would weave in other things that you would read. I mean, read the whole thing should be the name of your blog. Um, <laughs> and but but I also knew that because I'd been reading your blog quite a bit and I'd been talking about it with some of my own little networks. But I also knew just from pastoring a local church that a lot of people don't read. Now, that's to their detriment. But, you know, podcasts and videos tend to have a broader scope, especially among people who are not as bookish and wordish as those of us who are sort of in this Zoomer right. class. And so I, I wanted to do some of what you did in your blog on a YouTube format. I didn't know anything about YouTube. And of course, Jordan Peterson came along and I think I discovered Jordan Peterson because you wrote about him. And, and then, so then I-, I Both of us. <laughs> yeah. And so then I-, I I saw Jordan Peterson doing his biblical series and I thought, I bet you there's a lot of lonely people out there that don't want to watch that by themselves. And I saw Twitch, people would play video games and lots of people watch people play video games. Yeah. I thought, I wonder if people will sit with me and watch a video. Mm -hmm. And so then I started doing commenting and then people started to approach me. And these were people that basically were refugees for, of nihilism because they found that the <laughs> materialistic really view worldview just simply was empty. And so John Vervecchia is sort of in this camp. He was the one that coined the meaning crisis. But John was also sort of, he's a little bit, I think a lot of academics look at him as suspect because he's much more open in terms of other ways of thinking. And we'll see where John goes. I, I've, I, uh, we'll, we'll see where John goes eventually. But so but, but all of these conversations I did with people who came to me after watching Jordan Peterson, often men, because they, they were just simply depressed because of nihilism. And then Jordan Peterson gave them an insight into vision and purpose. And so they took that. But I knew that very quickly that they could watch Jordan Peterson and sort of get energized, something like someone goes to a, someone goes to a crusade and goes down the aisle, you're full of enthusiasm, you're going to do it right now, but you need a community, you're probably going to need an institution, you're going to need a track to follow to actually continue to grow in this and not simply be tossed by every coming wave. So I, I think the challenge of, of the next phase, I think your book is well-timed as your books have been, I mean, you've had a really, I mean, cultures are massive and they move very slowly. And, you know, thinking back, your Benedict option was well-timed and lived not by lies is well-timed. And I think this next book is well, is well-timed too, because I think the challenge is going to be once people finally open their eyes to enchantment, as with the story you just told of people coming up with folk or peasant culture, continuing to play around with voodoo or Santeria, which have been alive in Latin America for a very long time. These things have never gone away. Mm -hmm. The questions are going to be, okay, now we're back into an enchanted world. How do we, how do we know the truth when in some ways with re-enchanted people in modernity, enchantment itself was the direction, but that's insufficient too. Right, right. And maybe we should talk briefly, define our terms and what we mean by enchantment. I think that word puts a lot of people off because it makes them think, especially evangelicals, it makes them think that we're talking about woo-woo and fooling with things that we have no business fooling with. That's not what I mean. When I say enchantment, I'm making reference to the famous Max Weber theory of disenchantment, that in modernity, uh, the presence of God and the presence of spirit is not strongly felt anymore that, you know, in, in ages past, people had a very strong sense of the presence of God in 
in things and around them. We don't live in that world anymore. I think, I, I believe with all my heart and have staked my life on this, that God is everywhere present and fills all things. But uh, I, I think our problem is that our vision, modern people's vision, has been occluded by a lot of wrong things, uh, theological mistakes, uh, epistemological mistakes, metaphysical mistakes. And I wanna try to correct that. And um, I'd like to get your take on what, what enchantment means. And then I wanna talk about the weird effect. I think enchantment has always been with us, but it has been suppressed. And the suppression has reduced religious institutions' tacit knowledge of how to live in an enchanted world. And I think I think when you talked when you talked right now about people have a strong sense of the presence of God in things and around them, when I listened to the first big public uh, conversation between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, the big takeaway from that was Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris were talking about two different gods. So I called them God number one and God number two. Jordan Peterson believed that God was, in a sense, built into the system, even though Jordan Peterson himself, as a scientist, continues to struggle with this question of enchantment, because for him, his validation continues at least some level to be... Um, a scientific validation, which simply, and, and this is sort of where John Verveke's work goes, that isn't even coherent with respect to science. Yeah. It's so, but the the idea that the, the, the you, that there's, and Jonathan Peugeot really has leaned into this, that you have to begin with the first personal. <laughs> and I, I, I liken, so, Pascal had this dichotomy between the, a spirit of finesse and a spirit of geometry. Mm -hmm. And both of these views of the world are valid. And I think in some ways they line up with Ian McGillchrist's work on, on the brain. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought him up because that's he's at, well, at the center of my book. But Oh, okay. Oh, so, good. We get to talk about it. Yes. Yeah, so, please, so guys, I, do it. Do it, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and I think I think there are, there are actually two modes that that we that we interact the world with, and that's the spirit of finesse and the spirit of geometry, and and we spirit, we deal with the spirit of geometry when we um, know how to take apart our personal computer or we know which camera to use. We have the kind of in depth knowledge that allows us to actually have dominion over something, which is something that we rightly have dominion over. That's the spirit of geometry. But the spirit of finesse, I think, is the, is the personal mode. It's the reason people who are not mechanics name their cars. And the reason people <laughs> talk to their computers and their technology, because they have a sense that when they are looking up, they have to enter a personalism mode in order to interact with something that is in a sense greater than their ability to comprehend it. And, and that in a sense is enchantment. And so now these modes are go up and down all the time. And that's part of the reason why we engage with our, with our pets personally, we name them. We, we, in a sense, our agency, we share our agency with them. Which, which is exactly the way in which every child comes into the world and becomes fully human. The, the parent at the cost, the mother at the risk of her life and the parents at the cost of their life, you know, in not tiny little segments, give their agency to their children and their children grow up into it. And, you know, if you look at Peugeot and his patterns, this is basically the pattern of the world. And once you understand this pattern of the world, you begin to believe that this pattern doesn't just stop with human beings because these were this was the line at which the enlightenment decided no persons above this line <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. it simply doesn't hold and we don't act that way well one of the uh, uh, 
epiphany moments for me was reading the this article that came out years ago, and now there's a book about the WEIRD hypothesis, capital W-E-I-R-D, stands for uh, Western, Western Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. It is a, a way of seeing the world um, that is that we take as normative in the West because we've lived with it for so long, but the psychiatrist who came up with this, or maybe it's a cultural anthropologist, said that actually most of the world doesn't see things that way, the way we do. And this has been why so many of our psychological, academic psychological studies have been misleading over the decades because they were performed on college students. And, um, but these are all Western people. And uh, in fact, Western psychology is not normative for human beings. And uh, there's a book by uh, uh, John Henrik, uh, Joseph Henrik from yep. Harvard yep. Uh, about this phenomenon. Well, that's one of the, the, the things I'm going to build my book on, Paul. Um, uh, Kale knows all this because I want to help the reader who doesn't know anything about this to understand that the sort of Western materialistic way of seeing the world is actually an outlier in human experience. Yep. And it's important that people understand this so they can begin to question their own premises, that the sort of things that we think are just obviously true are not obviously true at all. And this is why I think Lerman is um, also important with um, both your discussions, Paul, and, and, and what you've been thinking about, Rod, is that she really kind of clears out a space for, are you sure um, that it's not real? Okay, you this know, is that, Tanya Lerman, T.M. Yeah. Lerman, uh, Stanford, anthropologist who's is also going to be a big part of my book because she's written some really interesting stuff in embedding herself in um in communities. evangelical what's that communities both evangelical communities of communities of worship yeah but around the world which i think is really interesting so she's just a, sorry to interrupt but you know there's a she she embeds herself into a, a sort of a wiccan community in england she has embedded herself in um, evangelical communities in india Cal and in california. africa and california with the vineyard movement paul um yep. and uh i think that oh and, and uh, 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 an african-american catholic community in san diego and what 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 uh, i i i was struck by it in in, in sort of going to bring us real quick back around. Um, I think what she is doing in, in her work there is not dissimilar to the kind of space clearing that I believe Peterson is doing. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I run into people, um, and my experience on Twitter the last few days has been completely bonkers for other reasons, but the, just these testimonies like, yeah, like I was a materialist, I was an, a, a part of a full-throated member of the new materialist. I didn't believe in any of that stuff. And then Peterson sort of cracked open some space here that I, you know, if you would have asked me, you know, three years ago, if I would be here saying, I believe in God, I would have thought you were a madman and a crazy person, but here I am. And so I, I to go back to this sort of, this re-enchantment element, Rod, there does seem to be this space, you know, that is that is that has cracked open. Yeah, and this is what Tanya Lorman is doing. One of the things she's doing in her work is trying to find out what are the practices that these communities engage in to make God present uh, to them. And I, I, she's she's cagey, as she should be as a yeah, scientist, yeah. about what she believes and doesn't believe. I don't think she's a religious believer, but she doesn't. She seems more agnostic than atheist. But um, I, I, uh, this is something that from a Christian point of view, and this will be re-enchantment from a Christian point of view, because I believe the God of the Bible is the true God. Um, I, I, will, I want to find out what kind of practices actual worshiping communities, primarily Pentecostal, uh, but also Orthodox and Catholic and others, things that they do to keep our, keep their eyes fresh and their ears open so we don't fall into this sort of spiritual torpor where we we think, well, God's not talking to us, when in fact, he might be talking to us and we just can't hear him because of our own uh, orientation, our inner mental orientation, uh, or because our wills are not uh, align, harmonizing with, his, with the will of God. So we don't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. It's interesting to me also, the I call Jordan Peterson the unauthorized exorcist of the Gospel of Mark, yes. because he's not in the Jesus tribe, but he sure is exercising people 
because his effect has been, in a sense, to break a spiritual bondage on, on numbers of people. But again, if you empty the house, you need to fill it with something or other things will come in. And that, that to me has been, I, I've at least tried to have a role in that. No, I think TH, I've been, I've read Lerman for years and she's, you know, um, when God speaks, I mean, her, her books are also interesting. And, and, and I think the challenge is going to be, you know, listening to my friend now, John Verveke, you should probably talk to him for your book. You'd find him an interesting individual, but he, you know, we don't know quite how far down this, this stack goes. And my, actually my go-to example of that I got from you, Rod, which is don't sleep there snakes. This, yeah. this story that comes at the beginning where you have everyone from the tribe, look, there's the God and the yeah, missionary. Can back that up and tell, tell that story. For yeah, so please do, please it. do. Yeah, so you have this Bible translator with this, with I think it's a, a South American tribe deep into the heart of the Amazon. And he's gone there as a Christian, you know, a, a, a modern evangelical Christian who's going to translate the Bible into their language. And in fact, the, the story goes, he loses his faith. But he's he's there he's there in his his hut he's living with the people he's doing everything right he has his children there with them he's so uh, acculturated to the, the community and then one afternoon he's interrupted by you know there's there's a lot of chatter going on in the community people are calling to him come 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 see the god the god's at the other side of the river and and so of course he gets up he wants to go see the god and look he's right over there well where is he well he's right there and the entire village sees the god. And he and his children don't see the God. And well, here's the question, is the God there or not? And that framing, which is basically the enlightenment framing is obviously insufficient to deal with the evidence before us. The villagers are not lying. Yeah. They are seeing something. He is not. Where is the difference? Can the difference be accounted for merely in physics? Yeah, and what's interesting about that story, Paul, is that um, at the time this happened, he was a believing Christian. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Everett is his name. Everett was a believing Christian, couldn't see this demon God who was cursing them. Um, but he, he says in the opening of that book, and that this is the opening anecdote in his memoir about all that, he says that, you know, since then I've lost my faith and, and I've become a, sign, a linguist and blah, 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 and yet... I still don't know what happened that day. After I read the book and began writing about it back in 2008 or around then, I ended up reaching out to him. He's still teaching. And, and I said, have you come to any further conclusions since you published this? He said, no, I honestly don't know what to make of what happened there. But I, I thought that he was at least honest enough to admit that it freaked him out so much that even though now he believes in a purely materialist universe, he still can't get that. He's still haunted by what happened. Yeah. C.S. Lewis begins his book, Miracles, which is one of my favorite books of his, with a ghost story. And he says that the, purpose, the person who told me this ghost story doesn't believe in ghosts. Yeah, yeah. Jordan yeah. Peterson, in an early podcast, tells a ghost story of a haunted hotel room. And I, the person Jordan Peterson was staying with, this was a graduate student of his. I talked with that graduate student of his mm -hmm. who validates every element of Jordan Peterson's story, an independent witness. And there's no reasonable, it's a tiny little manifestation in the hotel room it's a tiny it, but this person i was talking to is is an atheist materialist and i asked him i says how do you account for this weird things happen oh okay That's yep. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but well you know here's the thing too um my father my late father he was at the center of a of an extraordinary situation. I've written about on my blog before. After his father died in 1994, uh, at my mom and dad's house, there was a haunting. There was poltergeist activity, and uh, I was there and witnessed it too. I was the first one who saw, who heard signs of it. An exorcist came, a Catholic priest. Uh, I was the only Catholic in the family. I was a recent convert then. And they dealt with it. And the thing they found out through extraordinary means, I won't go into it here, was that this was my grandfather's spirit for some reason. That, and the, he could not move on until my father forgave him. Because mm -hmm. what the priest and the, the little old Catholic Cajun lady who has a, had a gift of discernment, what they didn't know 
is that my grandfather had betrayed my father um, and he didn't mean to, but he did. And he grievously injured my father. And somehow after his passing, my grandfather, he could see that he could see what he had done. And he was so sorry about it that God, for whatever mysterious reason, and a reason that doesn't fit my cosmology or to <laughs> then or now, allowed him to stay. And the priest had my father said, do you forgive him? And my father said, I do. And that released my grandfather. There were no more problems there. And yet I, I thought, surely this will be the thing. Since my dad was at the center of it, he saw it all happen. This will be the thing that gets my dad back into church. No. Nope. And not only that, <laughs> nope. it, my, my father saw the power of forgiveness to release spiritual burdens. And, and, and still, it didn't. My, my father still carried every grudge he always kept. And, and to the day he died, I mean, he he was stayed mad at the Methodist Church. My family was Methodist for uh, almost all my life, and uh, my dad said, "But I'm not going to let him run me out of my church." Well, he even refused a church burial because of the principle of the thing. Yeah. I bring that up not to crack on my dad, but to show that yeah. you know a lot of people say, "If I just saw right. a miracle, right. I would believe." Right. No, you wouldn't. Right. If if belief requires you to do something you don't want to do, then you'll rationalize it away. I, I think part of the the part of the next movement we're going to need to see will have to, you know. So I talk to a lot of people who are Orthodox and Orthodox curious now, uh, and a lot of people sort of lament, and some Roman Catholics too, lament the Enlightenment. And there's a lot to lament about the Enlightenment. There's a lot to lament about the Protestant Reformation. All of, all of that is true. But the we're going to have to also find a way to, as every generation does, incorporate the, the entire, incorporate the worldview as best we can from top to bottom. And that will be difficult. I think Pentecostals, it's been interesting too, in the little community that has grown up around my channel, has been an interesting commonality between Pentecostals and Orthodoxy. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's been fascinating to watch. Pentecostalism, in a sense, was basically a, a full-throated denial of modernity. You know, I see your modernity, and I don't care. <laughs> I am going to do what I can. I'll, I'll take the hit in social stigma. You know, Fine. we'll do all this. I, I simply don't care. And and they and they charge forward. The difficulty is going to be, um, you know, figuring out how to once again have a cohesive, a cohesive culture around it. And I think the older traditions, the pre-reformational traditions, have tended to do better at that. As you said, you know, the Roman Catholics can can both have you know, very credible intellectual life and, you know, a tradition of exorcism, you know, it's going to take, it takes longer for the Pentecostals to sort of grow up into some of these other upper registers. I mean, it just takes time for cultures to, to mature, but this, I think will be the, the challenge of, of the, of the new awareness of enchantment, because just as you say, okay, the, the, the it's just as much a myth the 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 subtraction story as charles taylor calls it is just as much a myth you just because you see that doesn't mean seeing is not believing belief is a far it's it's a spiritual reality and we have to come to a much broader vision of what we mean by that word spirit well, you know, Paul, you mentioned earlier Ian McGilchrist, the uh, uh, British psychologist, psychiatrist, and uh, and I mentioned too that he's his work is going to be at the center of my book, and I think that Dr. McGilchrist is offering us, even though he's not a believer, he's offering us a way forward because we're not going to unsee what we've seen in the Enlightenment, and we don't have to do away with science at all. What Ian McGilchrist, from his secular point of view, says, and he draws on neuroscience here, is that we simply need more balance. Uh, McGill, for those who don't know, McGilchrist wrote a, a great book that came out in 2009 or 2010 called The Master and His Emissary. He has a new book that builds on that. It's quite deep. It came out last year called The Matter with Things. I'm still working my way through it now. It's quite dense. 
But his basic theory is that, you know, he talked, we, we all know about the left brain, right brain, the hemis brain hemispheres. The left brain generally is more abstract. It's where we do, it's the geometry thing you were mentioning. Whereas a lot of our noetic, emotional, intuitive perception is located in the right hemisphere. Now they both work together. It's, there's no clear split between them. But uh, McGilchrist says that we first take in perception of the world around us uh, in our right hemisphere. It sends it over to the left side for analysis. And the, if the brain is working well, then the left sends it back to the right for incorporation. The problem, according to McGilchrist, is that as a culture since the enlightenment, we have been stuck in the left side of the brain. In other words, we think that the, the analytical work that the left brain does is whole and sufficient and, and gives us a truer picture of reality than what the right brain does. McGilchrist says, actually, that's not true. Well, we need both sides working together in order to get a truer picture of reality. And uh, I asked him once when I first read Master and His Emissary, I started a correspondence with Ian and I asked him, are, are you religious yourself? He said, no, but if I were to become a Christian, I would become Orthodox because the Orthodox, as far as I can tell, are the ones who have the best sense of balance between left brain and right brain, which in, in, in the Ian McGilchrist uh, way of thinking, is the the best and most accurate hold on how to perceive reality? I think the the irony of the the left brain dominance of our culture is that it serves actually a right brain vision of mastery, which is exactly what stands in the way of you know, Lewis says, we are not just, you know, we are rebels that need to lay down our arms. I think part of the reason we refuse to understand that there are spirits above is because we are terrified of what that means about us. And we are full of ourselves. And we, we don't want to imagine that we are not like Neo in the Matrix, I don't like believing I'm not the master of my own destiny. Oh, okay. All about control. Yeah. It's about <laughs> control. Yeah, yeah. and, that, and, and that, that, that's Lucifer, that's Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost. I mean, his obsession is that he cannot admit out loud uh, that he uh, isn't, it, what is it? He says, our puissance is our own. You know, our strength is our own. My being is my own. And then you see that contrasted with Adam, you know, pre-lapsarian Adam, he wakes up into his being and he immediately looks up and he looks out and he talks to creation and says, can you tell me how I got here and, and, and where can I go? So, in the, so that I may adore him. So it's this, he open, he waken, he wakes up and he's like, I want to know and I want to serve. I want, I want, and, and, and it implies that he wakes up into uh, what, you know, what Peterson, I guess, would call a kind of a nested story, and he knows it right away. Satan refuses. He cannot accept um, that, that central fact, because in order, because then there's debt. Yeah, and, and I know, I've known people in my life, I, I can think of at least two of them right now as we're talking, who are tormented by the way they see the world. And it's a false way of seeing the world, but you can't, you know, I, I've tried to help them, I tried to help them see that they're really prisoners of their own way of thinking. And, but they prefer the pain they know to the possibility of being healed because at least that pain gives them a sense of, of control. And I think back to one of my favorite stories from the gospels about when uh, Jesus healed, cast the demons out of the garrison demoniac. What do the people of the town do when they see this man who's been living in the graveyard for years and years and years um, and who's been this demon-possessed freak, this monster? Jesus comes and heals him, restores him. You would think they would say, oh, master, come tell us what you know so we too could be healed. No, they tell him, get out of here, hit the road, because they prefer the, the familiar because it gives them a sense of control rather than to see this miracle. Yeah. And I, I think that's going to be a tell into as as the lid of modernity is lifted off and the the amount of the amount of enchantment people begin to see gets a little bit too much for them. 
you know, some of them are going to want to put the lid back on and, and a lot are going to be frightened of, I think that parable will be a parable for the next, you know, the next epoch in that this, I find this unnerving. And, and, and so I, I, I don't think we should fail to appreciate that motivation in bringing the enlightenment to us because it gave us a story that we finally found very comfortable and we prefer that story to the much more frightening story of the fact that there there are gods and there is a god and it's not us and this is <laughs> this is peterson's tears with pajot it's the the enormity of like could this be you know look we we get great comfort in things that we can control you know our world our routines all of those sorts of things but if 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 this is correct right then all of a sudden you recognize that there are things that i i you know the control narrative is just simply insufficient to account for reality i think that's what the three of us would probably you know sort of say yeah we we have to kind of admit that um but then if, if that's true, then then the blanket, right, the the sort of the comfort blanket um, is is sort of snatched away and you're then confronted with a, a radically, um, I don't know, more dangerous, but but just a bigger um, world. And, and that's too much. I mean, you know, you saw Peterson, I mean, the three of us in separate ways have talked specifically about that moment when he's crying with Pajot um, and saying, like, I, I can't, you know, it's the thought that it could be true is terrifying. I think that's yeah. something of the yeah. fact that he says. Well, do you know, uh, one of the inspirations for my book is uh, Michel Welbeck's work, the French novelist who is not any sort of believer, but he's a fantastic diagnostician of modern uh, emptiness mm -hmm. and lack of meaning. And there's a scene in the, his novel Submission that came out, I think, in 2010, around then, uh, maybe a little later, uh, where this Frenchman is, uh, Francois, he's uh, a dissolute academic, middle-aged, has no, no one in his life that he loves, drinks too much, but he's living in France in the near future, and uh, France is starting to move to Islam not because people are convinced by Islam, but because the, the, the French are just morally and spiritually exhausted. They want somebody who believes something to rule them. Anyway, he begins, Francois begins to wonder about Catholicism. I think he may have been raised Catholic and he goes to a, a medieval Catholic pilgrimage site, Rocamadour, and he begins to, he goes and sits there in the church while people are worshiping. And he begins to have a mystical experience and he begins to be carried away by it. But he catches himself and says, oh, it must have been something I ate. And he walks out and he eventually ends up converting to Islam, not because he believes any of it, but because to have a, a formal conversion would allow him to have three wives and have a good job. Um, but I, I find that, that moment really interesting. I think about myself going into, into the cathedral at Chatra. Why didn't I say, well, that was really cool. And then forget about it. What was it about me that the receptiveness and 17 year old me that made me walk out of there saying, I want to know this God. Yeah. You put I, it off, where, right? but, auto, but you did put it off. Though. I did put it off. No, I put yeah. it off because yeah. I wanted to have sex. Right. I was 17 right. years old. Yeah, no, no. But I think that's an important part of the story. Right. So, so right away, we know, you know, that it's sort of make me chase just not yet, Lord. This is an Augustine moment, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. We, we very, we're very familiar with that, but still it, it, it was sticky, right? It's stuck in you. You couldn't, you couldn't put it away. Well, and, and I did try uh, in college to come at God in, in ways to, in, I was making a deal with God, I, you know, like, Hey, you know, I, I'll do every, all of this stuff, but leave my sex life alone. You know, and it wasn't mm -hmm. that I was making much use of my sexual liberty, but it was the principle of the thing. <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, I, but it was the other I, unknown territory. <laughs> I, but, but you know, I have to say though that I, I also lied to myself back then, told myself that really I have I have real intellectual uh, questions about mm -hmm. all this. It was not about the mm -hmm. intellect at all. It was all about the heart, the will, and the body. I did not want to sacrifice my body. And this, I think, is one reason why, for me, the image of St. Galgano that the artist gave me is so important because 
He sacrificed everything, all of his passions. His sword is the symbol of his passions, and he embedded it in a rock. Didn't think he could do it. God gave him the grace to see this miracle, or yeah. to make this miracle happen. And I guess, I guess this is where you know I feel my Augustinian Calvinist roots because who who finally comes and the root that they come just seems to be God's authorship and authority. He, you know. I, I look at I look at Peter and Judas, and it's like, why one and not the other? Right. Um, and it's it's God's moving through all of this, and 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 we're stuck with this. We're stuck with this holy terror of, wow. If we are, you know, I use the illustration with my friend John Vervecki. I said, you know, the my dog my dog has a certain knowledge of me based on his consciousness. I can play tricks on my dog all day long because I see into the future. I have more rationality, all of these things. And then let's say if I'm an Iowa farmer and I have corn, the corn in Iowa feels like we're taking over the world because it's just corn forever. It's just corn. But the dog sees the corn and the dog's view of the corn is different because it's a level of consciousness. And the farmer's view of the dog is a level of consciousness. And then what we're beginning to see in our culture is that there are there are spirits above us that are having their way with us. And, you know, so in, in good orthodox hierarchy, those things keep going up. And we're, we, we're not terribly comfortable with where in the medieval period, human beings were, you know, oh, a heliocentric. We think we're the center of the world. No, wait a minute. In that, wor in that world, you're the bottom level. <laughs> the only yeah. place lower is hell. Right. Well, right. You know, the, the whole myth of progress so infects us. Um, we tend to think that, of course, we see things more clearly than the medievals did. And uh, of course, that's just a lie. That's a, a chronological lie. But I think trying to break that spell of, of the chronological snobbery is going to be one of, one of my, my tasks here. Well, I, I like that bit about snobbery because, I, you know, Paul, you brought up the 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 charismatics you know not the charismatics um pentecostals the pentecostals which is charismatic of course but you know that, that that as soon as you go there you sort of take an immediate hit in 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 social status hierarchies right and i remember my mom talking to me about this because she she's a a, a catholic charismatic woman and um she said she's like yeah i went to my first you know prayer meeting being like man why why am i here why am i here and she she you know she experienced it and she remember, she told me she said you know this was like pretty powerful stuff she's like this is not like my kind of thing like i'm a college educated woman like i i'm sophisticated first worlder here like what is this bizarreness you know long story short she of course uh, you know submitted to it and and, and all that but but I, I think there's something about that status um marker uh that brings you back to the to the apostles i mean you know this is you know this is this was not a popular thing to do right yeah. you know um i was lost my train of thought there sorry I, I, and when it does become popular other dynamics take over but we see yeah. this you know ross douthat's book about lyme disease yeah uh, we I see this all the time where people, the medical, modern medicine is powerful, and I thank God for mm -hmm. it, but there are limits around it. And mm -hmm. when people hit those limits, you know, they're, they're willing to grab the hem of the Lord because mm -hmm. they've got no other idea in their head. And to have him turn around and say, you know, your faith has made you whole, well, then suddenly he has our heart too. You know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you guys, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 55 years old. I've had weird things happen to me. Like I tend to be in the pathway of mystical, strange things, events and people. And uh, but I've learned to roll with it, you know, in a discerning way. But I also I, I don't I don't roll it around in my head and question as much as I used to. And the reason I bring this up now is last night I was out in a. Um, in a town in far eastern Hungary, Debrecen, they used to call it the Calvinist Rome um, because it was a so a big part, the capital of Reformation Hungary. Yeah. And um, but I, I was out there giving a talk to some college students, and I went out to dinner afterwards with a small group. And one of the guys at dinner, there was a, was a student, nineteen year old man. I couldn't believe he was nineteen. He was so mature. Um, 
the son of a Hungarian Lutheran pastor. Now, there are not a lot of Lutherans here. There are, there are a lot of reform, but this guy was Lutheran. And um, we just started talking. They were saying, well, tell us about your new book. And I started talking about this stuff. And then the p- other people at the table began to talk about miraculous things that had happened to them or to people they knew. And this young man sat, looked at me and said, um, t- dead serious in his eyes, he said, you know, I don't know if this counts as a miracle, but I've found that when I pray for things, they tend to happen. And um, I, w- I was just stunned by that. And when uh, a couple of the, the other people at the table got up to go to the bathroom, I leaned across to him and said, look, I believe you. And here's what I'd like you to pray for me. Here's something that I'm deeply struggling with and it's, it torments me, please pray for me. And he looked at me, I mean, with these eyes that looked ancient and said, I'll do it. And the last thing he said to me as we were on the street uh, saying goodbye before I walked back to my hotel, he said, I'm not going to forget to pray for you. And I said, well, thank you. So I'm walking back to my hotel in the darkness there in this town, and the town's vacant. And suddenly out of nowhere, this feeling of warmth just, in, just immersed my heart. And I was like, whoa, what was that? And I said, I bet he just said a prayer for me. Yeah. And I don't know now. I'm going to try. I, I'm hoping he writes to me. I gave him my card, mm-hmm. but I don't have his card. But, um, and I'm going to ask him, I'm like, did you pray for me right after we left? But um, it gave me a sense of hope. And I, I got back to my hotel room just feeling, I'm just praising God for it because whether it came from the prayers of this young man or God just visited me and, and gave me a blessing, it was real and it was palpable. I physically felt it. I, and again, all my years of pastoring, both in mission work and here, I, I've, I have absolutely no question about that. This stuff happens all the time. It really does. The difficulty we have is when that, you know, young, young child in the church gets childhood leukemia and the entire church rallies around and the child dies. That and you know, Luce Meads, when he was at Fuller Sem, you know, wrote that book. You know, should we should we celebrate a miracle? And that was during the John Wimber signs and wonders uh, moment at Fuller Sem. I don't know if you're going to look into that in terms of your book, if you know anything about that. I don't, but uh, offline, send me an email because I, I need to know about it. I just don't know the Protestant world very well at all. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll 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 shoot I'll shoot you that message. But so you know you can look up John Wimber. John Wimber basically was one of the founders of the Vineyard Movement because oh, yeah. here's a Presbyterian minister, and um, so he wrote Power Evangelism, Power Encounter, Fuller Theological Seminary had a Signs and Wonders class, and then the question oh. was, can we in a now the now you get to the roots <laughs> of the university. Can we at even a Christian university have a class that teaches people how to be practitioners of miracles? Boy, there's some theological reflection to do on that score. And Mm -hmm. and so Smeeds wrote a book and um, that, that I think, um, you know, if you make your way to California would be an interesting rabbit trail because it went all the way down with this, with this question. And Mm -hmm. It's, and, but again, it gets back to what we were talking about before. We finally are the sheep of his pasture. And the Lord is sovereign and he loves us. And I tell people often, if you are God's tool, if you are, think about a mechanic in a garage and you're God's favorite tool, he's going to put you on his hardest jobs and he's going to stress you more than anything else. And, you know, we find that in the gospel with St. Paul. You know, 2 Corinthians 12. No, I'm, I'm going to leave that thorn of flesh in you because my grace is sufficient for you. And that's finally what you need to do is, is know that I am God and you are not, and I will use you as I choose. That's mm. terrifying. Damn. Paul, I have a question. Yeah. Is, can I ask you? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll go ahead, bro. Okay, yeah. I mean, can, can one's um, personality... You know, I know Peterson talks a lot about personality and all this sort of stuff, but can one's personality be that gift? Absolutely. The God of redemption is the God of creation. Mm-hmm. He, he has, you know, this is why, this is he, his sympathy for the devil. He just mm-hmm. can't win because right, God right. holds all the cards. That's why Christianity isn't a dualism, right. you know, and, but God right. isn't, 
Scott isn't a lousy fiction author that cheats from the start. It's, <laughs> it's the best story imaginable, but he holds all the cards and the devil can always only borrow. <laughs> <laughs> I I want to tell a couple of stories that I've run across in researching this book that um, they're going to be in the book. And I just want to get bounce them off of you and uh, miracle stories and get your take. Uh, the first one came uh, last year when I was in Spain um, uh, on a book tour for the Live Not My Lies Spanish version. I met this young Italian man in, uh, in Barcelona. He is married to a Spanish woman. And he had, had a very profound conversion, been raised atheist in Rome, uh, didn't even never thought about God. One day he was walking down the street in Rome with some of his buddies. I think he was a college student right out of college. A homeless man walks up to him out of the middle of nowhere, addresses him by his name, Giorgio or whatever, and says, uh, I'm come, come to you from Christ. And he started telling him about his life, things that this homeless man had never seen before, could not possibly have known. And he witnessed to them and he turned around and walked away and disappeared. And the young man converted. And uh, he's, I said, well, look, I'm going to be starting this book. I'd really want to come back and get this on the record. But um, I mean, he absolutely changed his life. And this is the testimony, right? Um, it, his life was very different. Not only did he convert, but he dedicated the rest of his life. I think he teaches in a Christian school. Second story I want to tell is about, um, I was out in uh, far Western, far Western Austria, speaking at a Catholic parish a couple of years ago. And it was a parish festival. And one of the speakers there was a young man from America, maybe Missouri, a kid named Kevin Becker. He's maybe 22, 23 now. Have you heard about this guy, Paul? No. No. Gail, no. Yeah. Um, anyway, Becker uh, was, I think he was raised Catholic, but not very, not practicing. He was in his, uh, in a house he shared when he was in college with some buddies. They, he was sitting up in the window on the second floor. Uh, they were clowning around. He fell out, landed on his head, and he very nearly died. He was in the hospital in a coma. Uh, it didn't look good for him at all. Somebody his mother knew, some friend of his mother, came by and brought uh, a, a picture of this Catholic, um, he's a blessed, he, uh, uh, Pier Giorgio Frassati. Yeah. Pier Giorgio was a young man who uh, in Turin, who was born into a wealthy family, but he devoted himself as a young man to working for the poor. When he died early at age 24 of tuberculosis, um, like 10,000 people showed up in the street to to see him off and uh, he was he was canon uh, not canonized beatified by the catholic church because they found one miracle they could attribute to him and felt this was really and he just needs one more to be canonized anyway the the uh, the catholic friend of the mom put the picture by his bedside they began to ask pierre Giorgio for his intercession for kevin's healing well kevin woke up out of the coma and uh and he was fine the thing, and they, they, the doctors had said, if he survives this, he's going to be probably seriously impaired mm -hmm. and need help all his life. He was fine. And he told them a story about something that happened while he was asleep. He said that a, um, a young man, Italian man came to him and said, my name is George and uh, I'm here to help you. You're not going to die. You know, God loves you. And it just, Let's just be here together till it's time for you to go back. Something to that effect that you can mm -hmm. find the details online. This has been written about. Mm -hmm. And he said, but you'll be healed. And when they showed Kevin the picture of the blessed Pier Giorgio, he said, that's him. That's, that's George. So um, this is all now at the Vatican. And, uh, and Kevin, by the way, he walked out of the hospital like three days later under his own power, a guy they never thought would walk again. And uh, this is now at the Vatican, and this might be the miracle that has uh, Pier Giorgio Frassati canonized. But um, there's Kevin. He's this ordinary guy, this most ordinary middle American young man you could ever hope to see. And the mystery is, why him? And why not all these others who, you know, who are equally deserving, maybe even more deserving? Maybe even more, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but I, I think a lot of people like to say that, well, see, miracles can't be real because God doesn't behave like we think he should. 
<laughs> that is certainly the case. <laughs> God does not behave like we think he should. And like the psalmist says, God is in heaven. He does what he wants. Yeah. And that should terrify us. Yeah. But, but that's yeah. where, of course, the faith is trust that, um, you know, just recently I've been listening. There's the CCM song, even if, um, I forget, but I forget mercy me, I think does it. And, um, it's basically that, you know, so here's this saint dies at 24. It's like, what, not even 30. I mean, Jesus got the 30. Why, why do you take him at 24? <laughs> what, what do you, what, what is the, what is the dog going to say to the farmer? What is the corn going to say to the farmer? What does the pot have to say to the potter? And we, we hate that. We are full of ourselves and mm -hmm. he's placed eternity in our hearts. And with a bit of that eternity is some of our ambition. Oh, my, right, my late sister. I'm sorry, Kale, go ahead. No, no, no. My, my late sister, Ruthie Lemming, I, I wrote a book about her, her life and her death from cancer. Um, you know, she told me before she died uh, at the age of 42, she said, you know, people keep coming up to me saying, why you? Why, why would God let this happen to you? And she said, I just tell them, oh, why not me? You know, this, and I thought that there's so much profundity there. You know, she was she was scared to die. She didn't want to die, but she knew that this was all in God's hands. And um, and well, she. I, I mean, like, what's it at 42 or 82? I mean, really, we're we're, we're gonna we're gonna quibble with God about 40 years? I mean, yeah, I know things happen in those 40 years, and obviously, you want to be alive for your children and God, you know, God willing, grandchildren and all those sorts of things. But I mean, really, 40 years. In, in, in the context of eternity, like it just seems, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm being too flip about it because I'm now past 42, but I don't know. <laughs> well, um, guys, I, it's getting a little bit late over here, but I want to throw one more thing out mm. there before we, we wind up. Um, I'm here in Budapest, beautiful city. Central Europe is gorgeous. Europe is gorgeous. I feel so at home here. I love being around old things and beautiful things. And yet the faith is dying here. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, very few people in this country, it's culturally Christian in a way that America was 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. but it's not church going Christian. Mm -hmm. I have some friends who are Catholics and Protestants here who are church goers, but it is a, a very secular and secularizing culture like the rest of Europe. I, I, there's a part of me that likes to think that if we had beautiful churches in America, beautiful monasteries, things like that, we would be more faithful. But I don't think that's true because Europe has all these things and we're actually in church more as Americans than they are. What do you think about that, about the connection between beautiful places and faith? I think you're right. And I, you know, right now the beauty first, I mean, Bishop Aaron says it with uh, his four horsemen video with Peugeot and Peterson and Verveke, the beauty first is right now pretty hot. And, you know, Peterson thinks, Oh, you know, boy, psychedelics, because here's, here's something that we can have in a, put in a pill or in a substance and put into people. And I mean, all of those visions, I think always have, and anytime we take a vision and say, this is what we hold in our hands and we will bring the kingdom. I, I think God gives, God invites us to participate, but it is, it is his work. And, and we finally, you know, we, we must strive with all that we can in service and obedience to him, but it is finally his work and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we have these mysteries that we live with. And I was going to say, Kale, to the 40 or 42 or 82 thing that so often that the really hard things that I see that God calls people to are not so much necessarily the early death, but the long suffering of obedience. Right. You know, right. is it is it easier to die at 42 or to live between 42 and 82 in, in long, hard, obedient, faithful suffering? You know, you look at Mother Teresa, the, you know, my Calvinist buddy writes this little, you know, biography of Mother Teresa, which, you know, opened my eyes to the fact that she lives all of these years thinking that God had abandoned her. Like most of them, like most of them, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, most and, of and them. And so what, what, is, what is the hard thing God calls us to? Um, well, that one hit me right across the, 
the chest here. Um, but I, I wanted sort of to, to go to taking that and bringing it to Rod's question about these beautiful, you know, the, 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 the exoskeletons of European Christianity, you know, and, and you know, uh, you know, I know many people here in this country would, 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 would die quote unquote, die to be able to worship on any given Sunday in one of these, one of these churches, you know, that are, you know, if you've been to Rome, for instance, there's, you know, a dime a dozen, like every block has got three just churches that you just can't even believe, you know, and they're empty, right, by and large, right, and, you know, why is the exoskeleton not enough, like, why isn't it sufficient, you know, and I think, I think, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about what you know, what, what it is that Rod and I are trying to do, you know, some of the stuff we talk about on a weekly basis is kind of culture war stuff, but that's, that really is an attempt to get, I think, at something more that's going on in the culture. And, you know, the, you know, I, I tweeted out last night, I'm like, oh, my worlds are converging today. You know, I've got, um, you know, my, my Orthodox friend, Rod, and my Protestant friend Paul and and me, a Catholic, are, are, are strolling into a Zoom room together. And I wonder if part of the exhaustion that we feel, you know, you talked about in a slightly different say, you know, all of us are are refugees from the meaning desert, you know, this nihilism. And I, and I, I wonder, I mean, are we really going to just be able to pretend, continue to pretend that the the tearing apart of the body of Christ um, through our various traditions and our ecclesial, you know, uh, commitments, et cetera, are we, do we really think we can get away with that? You know, and I wonder if part of the exhaustion is that, I mean, the fact that the three of us are having this conversation right now, and we're not really even talking ecclesiology here, we're talking about other things that I think tend to grab our attention, our consciousness congresses, you know, we would say, um, but, you know, so, much of this this problem we couldn't have we wouldn't have this conversation 25 years ago assuming that youtube existed 25 years ago this would not be able to happen you know because we're all you know heretics on in in some way here wow. and and here we are we're trying to tease something out because you know as paul is always talking about is like trying to get it to the underneath stuff you know this sort of this this base layer or this whatever this other layer that is where the unity exists and and are, are our problems rod you know from you know the fact that you're in this beautiful place and nobody's going to church is it is this just the residue of, of trying to paper to you know piece together this thing that needs to really actually be resolved i, I think that there's just there's a lot to, of course to explain what's happened to Europe. A lot of it has to do with the French Revolution, with World War I or World War II, with 40 years of communism. And that has a lot to do with it. But I think, um, I think this place has become just dispirited. And we in America are becoming that way too. We've, been, we've, we've just lost the zeal for, for the Lord. And uh, mm -hmm. we've lost the fear of God. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, those, sound, those are very churchy expressions, but I think <laughs> they're actually... Yeah, well, Philip Reef said, uh, famously, uh, unbelieving Jew, but Philip Reef said, what the world needs now is holy terror. We have lost holy terror, which is his phrase for the fear of the Lord, meaning not the fear that God is going to sit up there and strike us down with thunderbolts, but rather uh, a, a visceral awareness that there is something greater and that we will be held, we're subject to it, we will be held accountable by it. Uh, the modern world, Reef said, has no holy terror, and this is at the bottom of why we're falling apart. And I think all of us here in this room, all three of us from these different traditions, I think uh, we have probably seen in our lives um, the insufficiency of the way people, many people within our traditions go with this. You know, this is, we're, uh, your friend Steve Skojic, um, uh, Kale, was talking about uh, one of his substacks recently about Jordan Peterson and why it is that you know Jordan Peterson spoke to him with so much more power and and, and changed his life in a positive way than anybody in the church ever did. He, Steve was a very traditional Catholic for most of his life. He's now really struggling to hold on to his faith, but um, I, I think that that might be part of the answer to what you just said, Kale. It's that you know. 
I don't know Paul as well as you do, but I, I would imagine that all of us here are seekers in the best sense, not, not seeker. We want to find, and we do believe we find, but we also know that there's something about the, the times we live in today and the different churches, plural, we live in today that in some ways seem afraid of the search and, um, and, and try to substitute platitudes for it or uh, just throw propositional arguments out there or insults to people who question as a way of dealing, of coping with their own fear. Totally. The cope, the cope is hard, as I like to tweet out. The cope is hard. And I think that's what you see, the kind of brinksmanship of sort of full-throated ecclesiological arguments. It's just, it's stop, you're pretending. You know, you're not, you don't really believe that. It's also in in fairness to in fairness to the ideologues of our particular divisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We we all need something instantiated to be zealous about and to pursue with all of our hearts. And so we, we do live between this, you know, the Abram Kuyper, the um, you know, the patron saint of my Dutch Calvinist tradition. He he ironically talked both about the antithesis and about common grace. And you just always need both. But we struggle with both, that you need that zeal, which and instantiation. Now we have, you know, a generation ago, we had the young, restless and reformed. Yeah. Now in my corner, we have the the orthodox bros. I mean, yeah. and I talked to some of these young men and they are church fathers and orthodoxy yeah. and yeah. they're just yeah. they're just going great guns for it. And I you know, and I'm all wet because of all of my Dutch Calvinism. And I, I just smile and I praise God for their zealotry. And you, you just go, you just go. And so I don't know. I don't know. It's sort of like these dead cathedrals that the Lord, the Lord is working. And I, it's, it's, I, I, well, I got to trust he, him. He spoke to me through a dead cathedral, uh, quote unquote, dead cathedral. Right. He, he used it to call to me. And um, if there's anybody, I mean, my, my books are translated uh, widely in Europe. And if there's anybody who has called back to him um, because of what they read in my books, then I'm just giving back what they gave to me. Mm -hmm. You know, God didn't reach me. God reached me through foreigners, through those who built the, the cathedral at Chatra and through this Guatemalan born Monsignor Carlos Sanchez. You know, he sent them into my life. And, uh, you know, I, when I was in, uh, in Romania last summer uh, on a book tour, uh, I, my, my publisher there said, we only expect about 100 people to come to the talk. We hope you're not offended. I said, oh, I'm not. Thank you for having 500 people showed up. And it turned mm -hmm. out that and it shocked my publishers. These were people from the countryside, Orthodox Christians who had heard the social media I was coming. And the thing that drew them was that here was an American, and they still esteem us Americans. Here was an American coming there, telling them that your faith is nothing to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. Your traditions are nothing to be ashamed of. Claim them, stand on them mm -hmm. boldly. It turned out, and I knew none of this, that in Romania, even the conservative politicians in Bucharest tell all these people, you got to put all this stuff behind you. We've got mm -hmm. to be progressive, modern Europeans, and et cetera, et cetera. And these people told my publisher, this guy coming from America brings us hope. And I mean, I, I got tears listening mm. to it because, I mean, I'm just a chucklehead from the bayou. <laughs> but I mean, this is God. This is what yeah. God does, right? That's and right. I was just trying to be faithful to what they gave me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I'm just so grateful that God has taught me over the years of following him. Gosh, I guess I've been following him for uh, half my life now. Mm -hmm. And um, he's taught me to have an eye open for mystery and for grace coming to us in uncommon uh, in, in ways, but uh, be discerning, but don't shut it off because it's taking us places that, uh, that, that make us uncomfortable. And that's why I reached across the table last night to this kid I just met 30 minutes earlier and told him, I'm suffering in this particular way. Please pray for me. And he, he, he received it. He okay. received it exactly as I meant it. And uh, I'm, I'm going to remember that guy's eyes the rest of my life. The, the, the force is strong with that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and to wrap up, I mean, I, 
Paul, I'll give you a last word here, but I, this is why I, I, I just keep, I mean, your words, you know, this idea of these long spirits that work through us, you know, you, Rod, you talk about, you know, you've been following the Lord for half your life and, and, and your, your story, your witness is that he's been following you for more than that, you know, and he's been grabbing you and, and working backwards in and out of time, you know, to bring you here in ways that, you know, we just can't possibly comprehend. You know, but but we know, but but you are testament to the spirit, right? Or the spirits. I mean, I, you know, how you know there is a hierarchy, you know, but that that idea that um that and, and it's not all just you know like rainbows and unicorn spirits. Like I think all three of us are very serious about the fact that one of the reasons why we 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 are I am worried about the way that people are playing, for instance, with psychedelics and whatnot, is that I'm worried that, yeah, fine, you can have a spiritual experience, but do you know what kind of sp spiritual experience you're going to have? You call it a bad trip. Like, all right, well, you know, and it doesn't uh, you just know, go away. No, you know what it is, Kale, about, yeah. about psychedelics? I, my theory has, has been that you can analogize it to winning the lottery. I believe that when you do psychedelics, you can have an actual openness, an extraordinary openness to the world of the spirit, but it's unearned. It's mm -hmm. like you, you can have the sort of thing by putting at, drop an acid or whatever, yep, yep. you can have a sort of experience that might come to mystics after a lifetime of meditation, fasting, and so forth, mm -hmm. but it's unearned. What mm -hmm. happens to people, many, many people who win the lottery, they yeah. destroy their lives, right. right? And so I think there's that analogy, but I also think, and this is maybe something for another podcast, that um, I, I think that there is not a strict separation between the material and the right. spiritual. I mean, we we come to know God and the presence of God through our bodies. There's, there's no way around that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, the, these people, when you take these chemicals, these special chemicals that open you up to the world of spirit, you don't know what you're gonna get, you know? And that's why you, I read about the ayahuasca people. Right. I think this is right. really one of the most dangerous things going on now because the people who use ayahuasca in, in South America, there have been entire traditions built up around this to keep it from being abused. And so you have all these Westerners coming in there and just diving into it. And I, I would say people willing to exploit them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, not just I, people, right? Not just people. Again, not to be too woo. Up. Yeah, it levels up. I mean, oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, and I just think it's important in the context of this conversation that this is exactly you know, kind of what we're talking about. It's um, weird as as you're talking about this, the sunlight is glowing. I know. Off yeah, I know, I know. I know. Sorry. And Kale's I'm face sorry. began to glow. I know. I know. <laughs> it's like oh, the uncreated light. There it is. <laughs> sorry. Well, well, we've had a see. We're having a season change right now. And so I used to record at this time of day, and it was fine because it was winter and dark and horrible. And now all of a sudden, the sun's coming back, which is great because I think I do have seasonal affective disorder. Yeah. But you know, it, it's really ruining my podcast setup here. So this oh, is just, no, no, just yeah. just wait till you see. This kale, you yeah. really, literally, your eyes yeah. are glowing. You can't even oh, see God. them. Oh, Lord. Okay. Well. Yeah. Marvel's right. got nothing on you. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I would say that, you know, I would say that our our God is such a story writer that he can have Rod Dreer in mind when he's um when he's not letting Saint Galgano go. Hmm. And of course, not just Rod Dreer, but the people downstream from Rod's books. Mm -hmm. and and that the the strangeness of this world i know it gets laughed off by the new atheists but the strangeness of this world partly can be understood and we can see it i love how nathan jacobs in a conversation i had with him a while ago you know talked about the unreliable narrator well that narrator is only unreliable if you don't understand what the narrator is doing and the same <laughs> for the author mm -hmm. and and the author of the story of this world is 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 unlike any author any of us have ever known and all of the authors we do know the mm -hmm. best of them learn from him and so don't introduce saint galgano in the first act if you're not going to have rod Dreer show up in the third <laughs> that's right so what is it uh the yeah that's great that's great that's no great. It, it'll be really interesting because galgano has been mostly forgotten even in italy but um and you can still go there and pray at the sword of the stone they have it covered with thick plexiglass now but um People do go, but um, after this book comes out, God willing, a lot more people will go yeah. there and, okay. and see it. And by the way, Paul, um, the, uh, the, the Vatican, Galgano was so famous in his day that even though he died only about a year after his conversion, bishops and abbots came to his funeral. Yeah. 
and uh, the Vatican opened almost right away a cause of canonization for him. They sent uh, a cardinal up there to take testimonies from people who had known him. His, his mom was even still alive. And so all of this stuff is attested to. It's still in the Vatican archives. The, the people who had seen what happened to him, the changes that had made in his life, they would go to him. People would go for prayer. People would be healed by his prayers. And the sword and the stone was there from the very beginning. They testified to it. And, and, and lastly, you know, and, and underneath it all, you know, is this radical encounter with the real, you know, the real. That's, that's, that's what we're all sort of burrowing our way toward or, or, or flying up to. It's, it's always the real. So, all right, well, okay. Well, great. Thank you, guys. This has been fantastic. We're way over our normal allotted time. I know, Paul, you're a veteran of these long ones. You can go. But uh, it is getting late for, for our friend Rod yeah. here. So I just want to thank you, Paul, for coming on. Rod, as always, thank you. And watch you send us out. Don't get nothing on you. All right.